In my view, the essence of law fundamentally lies in ensuring the safety and protection of people within society. Sadly, the reality is that there are individuals who skillfully misuse these laws for their own corrupt purposes. To effectively combat such malpractices, a deep understanding of the law is incredibly important. My name is Maria. Justice is the order of society itself, is a profound saying left by the great ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle. Here, the term order refers to the basic rules and principles necessary for society to function orderly. So, what exactly does justice mean? Typically, justice means actions and mindsets that are morally acceptable, but what is considered morally acceptable can vary depending on temporal, geographical, religious, and ethnic perspectives. For instance, during wartime, avenging an enemy was seen as just, and for deeply religious people, strictly adhering to their religious teachings could be considered the highest form of justice. However, in modern society, harming an enemy is viewed as a crime, and for those without a religious background, deriving justice from these teachings can be challenging. While this might lead to a philosophical discussion, it would be fascinating to know what Aristotle would say about this issue today. Personally, I believe that building a society where people can live safely and securely, and upholding the rules to achieve this, represents the true form of justice in our contemporary society. Ever since my childhood, I often found myself deeply pondering the concept of justice. That was undoubtedly influenced greatly by my father, but I also feel it was due to my innate nature and temperament. My father was an incredibly honest person who had a strong disdain for injustice. From an early age, he would frequently explain to me and my younger brother, who is four years my junior, about the ideal behavior of a human being in a way that was understandable even for us as children. These discussions, presented in an age-appropriate manner, resonated deeply with us, making us susceptible to the influence of his words. Reflecting on my innate temperament, I feel that being born as my father's daughter speaks volumes about the significance of genetic influence. As I entered middle school, my interest gradually shifted towards the world of law. Around that time, TV drama series focusing on legal professions, especially prosecutors, judges, and lawyers, were being broadcasted in succession and were highly acclaimed among the public. Although I had a strong sense of justice, being a young middle school girl easily influenced by trends, I was captivated by these series. What set me apart from other middle schoolers was my deep interest in the actual content of these professions and my keenness in contemplating how I would act in such roles. Naturally, I had the typical reactions of a general viewer, like admiring popular actors in the series, but my interest was strongly drawn towards law and the legal world. The fact that a series of legal dramas were aired that year was one of the factors that attracted my interest, although it's something I don't usually talk about. Even if it was the series that sparked this interest, it's undeniable that they moved my heart leading me to aim for the faculty of law in college, work hard to succeed in this field, and eventually secure my admission. I usually refrain from praising myself, but in the study of law, I achieved particularly excellent results, and after four years of dedicated study, I was able to graduate from college with outstanding grades. After graduation, I carefully considered my career path and spent two years working in a field I was interested in, gaining many valuable life experiences. Following these experiences, my interest in legal professions was rekindled, and I had the opportunity to work at the administrative office of the organization overseeing the Bar Association in America. This job broadened my perspective, fueled my purpose in life to confront social injustices and explore ways to support those who are powerless. As I immersed myself in this work, time seemed to fly by and before I knew it, I was approaching my 30s. At that time, the president of the Bar Association where I worked suggested a transfer to a Bar Association in New York. The president believed that my skills were needed to improve the challenging situation in there. 
Excited for the new challenge, I happily accepted the offer. In New York, to become a lawyer, one must apply to the American Bar Association, which oversees all the bar associations in the state. In each law firm where lawyers belong, a variety of tasks are carried out daily, and the reality is that the bar association itself is not the place for directly receiving cases from clients. My role involved managing the operation of legal consultations for citizens, one of the essential services provided by the Bar Association. In reality, the number of people facing legal troubles is far greater than generally expected. I had a deep desire to assist as many of these people as possible and contribute to the resolution of their problems. Individual law firms and lawyers specialize in specific areas of law, each with their own expertise. For example, some are experts in criminal cases, others specialize in civil litigation, and some are proficient in handling traffic accidents or divorce issues. Within the jurisdiction of the Bar Association, there are several offices that focus on legal consultations for citizens, and these firms not only acquire cases through consultations but also actively engage in low-profit areas. This represents a stance of prioritizing the welfare of citizens. A lawyer named Kevin, whom I greatly respected, was part of such a firm and dedicated himself to the Bar Association's legal consultation services. His emphasis on the perspective of citizens had a profound impact on me. Maria, today's legal consultation desk is open until 5 p.m. Let's try to respond to as many consultations as possible. You're always so dedicated. Today seems to be busier than usual with more clients expected. He is very adept at listening intently to the client's stories and giving appropriate advice. Sometimes, complex issues arise that can't be solved with mere advice alone, and in those cases, he often proposes considering the use of a law firm, explaining the related costs in detail. This is not just for business purposes, but also a reflection of his strong desire to genuinely help people in trouble. Among the lawyers I've met, he stands out as a particularly impressive figure, receiving high acclaim as a top-notch lawyer with excellent abilities. Working together, Kevin and I have developed a close relationship, frequently exchanging not just work-related topics but also personal matters. Particularly once, when he confided in me about his deep concerns regarding a case he was handling, I asked him in detail about the case with great interest. Initially, he may have been hesitant to consult with me, an administrative staff member, but he eventually shared the situation openly with me. I carefully chose my words and shared my perspective, to which he expressed heartfelt gratitude and was pleased with the ideas. Oh, that's a perspective I hadn't considered. Thank you, it really helped a lot. His sincere and warm smile made me realize once again his generosity and richness as a human being. About half a month later, he came to me with a cheerful demeanor. I really appreciate your advice from last time. When I applied the method you suggested, everything went as planned, and the client was truly happy. It even boosted my reputation. That's wonderful to hear. I'm glad I could be of some help. Maria, you have such extensive knowledge of law and are excellent at problem solving. Did you ever work as a paralegal before? No, nothing that significant. I just did a bit of legal study, which is now being applied in my current job. I responded to his question indirectly, choosing to answer with a vague expression. Really? But you're still pretty smart. How about we go out for a meal somewhere as a way of showing my gratitude? Initially, I was hesitant, but moved by his enthusiastic invitation, I ultimately accepted the offer. It wasn't so much that I couldn't refuse, but more that I was actually pleased by the invitation. The restaurant he chose was a sophisticated space for adults, very stylish and with a calm atmosphere. It was a fresh environment that I had never experienced in my life before. 
Through our conversation, Kevin talked passionately about his work and also shared his hobbies, which were both attractive and intriguing. Our conversation was like a lively game of catch, exchanging thoughts and laughter. As the evening drew to a close, he looked at me with a meaningful expression. Thank you for joining me tonight. I invited you to express my gratitude, but honestly, I've wanted to spend time with you for a while now. I'm thrilled that my wish came true tonight, but it's sad to think that this is where it ends. Oh, I'm glad to be here too. Life with Kevin began to fill with new emotions and experiences, each day fresh and exciting. We shared our work-related concerns and supported each other. Seeing his work thrive brought me joy too. Sometimes, the phrase, behind every great man is a great woman, would come to mind, making me blush. It usually refers to a wife's role in supporting her husband's external activities, but my mind naturally drifted to marriage. As if reading my thoughts, Kevin suddenly asked, Maria, would you marry me? As he tenderly presented the ring, my heart overflowed with joy, and I silently thanked God. Thus, our marriage was decided. I never imagined I'd become a wife until recently. Warm congratulations from my parents and brother made me savor the happiness. My uncle, who had watched over me since childhood, also offered his blessings, though with a thoughtful expression. My father told me that my uncle, seeing me like his own daughter, felt a bit sad about my marriage. Married life was a daily adventure, full of trials and joys. After discussing with Kevin, I decided to continue working, and he fully supported me. His understanding nature made me even more committed to our home life. Since we both work, let's share the household chores. That's what equality in a marriage is all about. His warm words always supported me. When we celebrated our first wedding anniversary, we had a small celebration together. It symbolizes a still fragile relationship, but we hope to build a deep and strong bond over the years. However, something has been bothering me lately. Kevin recently quit his job at the Citizens Consultation Desk. He hardly shows up at the Bar Association and seems to have stepped back from face-to-face -face work at the law firm. It's clear that Kevin has his own views and vision for his work, but I feel a bit sad that he doesn't share these with me. It might be a matter of male pride or a desire to make his own decisions independently. But what's really bothering me lately is how late he's been coming home. In the early days of our marriage, he would return home right after work, but recently, he's been coming home late, sometimes even in the middle of the night. Kevin, have you been busy with work lately? I'm worried about your health. I wish you'd come home earlier. I'm busy with work, but I'm fine. Don't worry about me. Worrying is part of being a wife. You've been coming home late more often. I'm working late, so what's the big deal? Besides, I have a business trip this weekend. A business trip? Why all of a sudden? Is it such an urgent matter? Stop nagging. I need to go. You just have to see me off. With those words, he retreated to his room in irritation. That weekend, he really did leave for a business trip. Though it's not uncommon for lawyers to go on overnight trips, as far as I know, it's not that typical. When he returned from his business trip and brought me a famous local pastry as a souvenir, I felt no joy in my heart. His late returns continued, and there were many nights he didn't come home until after midnight. His absences on weekends and business trips had also increased. One day, when he came home, I noticed a long hair on his suit that wasn't familiar to me. Whether it was accidental or intentional, my heart was filled with unease and suspicion, but no clear answer emerged. Then, a shocking event occurred. On a day Kevin left home for what he claimed was work on a weekend, I went out to the downtown for a change of scenery. 
As I was walking through a busy street, I saw someone emerge from an alley ahead, and I stopped dead in my tracks. It was Kevin, who was supposed to be at work. It was unusual for him to be here at this time, but what was more disturbing was the unfamiliar woman at his side, walking hand in hand with him. Keeping my composure, I followed them almost unconsciously. After about 10 minutes, they disappeared into the hotel district. That night, I sat quietly in the living room, waiting for Kevin to come home. It was 12.30 a.m. when Kevin returned home. He casually hummed a tune as he entered, but was visibly startled to see me awake and sitting on the sofa. Welcome back, Kevin. You seem to have had an enjoyable time tonight. Well done. What, you're still up? It was more work than fun, actually. You know, I also went out today. And, you know, I happened to see you entering a suspicious place with a woman. Are you cheating? Kevin momentarily showed a flicker of disturbance at my question, but quickly regained his composure. What are you talking about? That's a huge misunderstanding. You should have spoken to me right there. That woman is a work associate. We were just talking at a lounge. A lounge, huh? But I noticed you have to get a room key from the front to enter that lounge. Quite interesting. I remained calm, probing with my words. You saw that? But don't jump to conclusions about cheating just because you saw us. I was just escorting her to her room. I see. Quite a courteous way to conduct business, isn't it? He couldn't hide his irritation at my sharp observation and retorted. Don't accuse me of cheating without evidence. Since it's a good opportunity, let's make it clear, let's get a divorce. I've lost interest in you. He said coldly. I can't believe you feel this way about me. We've only been married just over a year. Is there no love left? Kevin responded to my question with even more coldness. Love? If there was any, it was only in the beginning. I thought you were decent, so I chose you. But you didn't live up to my expectations. How can you say such cruel things? I'm just stating the facts. You're of no use to me. So, I'll divorce you and find someone better. I was shocked by the now ruthless attitude of him, whom I once thought was ideal. Is that why you cheated? I've said it multiple times, there's no evidence of cheating. The reason for divorce is incompatibility, the end of an equal relationship. You talk about a 50-50 relationship, but it's not true. What about compensation? Compensation? There's no evidence for that. But if you have it, I'll pay you $500,000. His overconfident attitude made me realize his foolishness, and I couldn't help but burst into laughter. Despite trying to stay calm, I couldn't suppress my laughter in that moment. Hey, do you really think so? My change in demeanor left him with an expression mixed with surprise and unease. Your affair partner was Sandra, wasn't it? The woman who works in your office. You thought she was convenient because her father runs a famous law firm, right? How do you know about Sandra? Sorry, I haven't been telling you everything, despite us being a married couple. I have my ways. Look at this. Saying that, I handed him a piece of paper. On it was a written statement from Sandra herself saying, I will no longer be involved with Kevin. Today, after witnessing them together, I waited for them to part ways. When Sandra was alone, I approached her, revealed my identity, and told her that I had evidence of the affair. She listened to my story, trembling with surprise and fear. Then I invited her to a nearby diner. 
At the diner, I had Sandra write a statement that she would no longer have any inappropriate relations or contact with Kevin. I did this in a public place to make it clear that it was done of Sandra's own will, not under duress or coercion. When Kevin saw the statement, he reacted with disbelief. What is this? You had her write this. Yes, this statement doesn't outright admit to an affair, but it essentially accepts its reality. In court, this would serve as advantageous evidence for me. As a lawyer of your caliber, you should understand that. He clenched the statement in his trembling hands, but I already had a copy of it, so it didn't matter if he destroyed it. I then showed Kevin additional evidence of the affair such as their messages and receipts from restaurants they visited together. When are these from? How did you get these? He lost his previously confident demeanor and his face turned pale. I never thought I could receive a settlement of $500,000 for compensation. My investigative skills were honed after graduating from college when I worked in my father's detective agency. My father, a man of strong justice, ran a detective agency focused on exposing social injustices. I inherited his sense of justice and, as part of my social studies, I spent two years there gaining investigative skills and practical experience. My decision to work at my father's detective agency was influenced by a TV drama series. It might have been similar to my initial feeling of choosing law, but there was a curiosity for new challenges. This was a part of my personal growth. My experience as a detective significantly contributed to my later career. As proof, I carefully took out a badge from my pocket and pinned it on my chest. Why do you have that badge? In response to his surprised look, I showed him the badge. It was a lawyer's badge. Actually, I'm a lawyer too, just like you. Sorry for not telling you. I had passed the bar exam while studying in law school and planned to become a judicial trainee after graduation, but I chose to train at my father's office instead. Later, I became a judicial trainee and then a lawyer after completing the training. The president of the first bar association I joined was my uncle. He welcomed me into his office to fulfill my desire to work with a broader perspective. His support made it possible for me to juggle two challenging roles. The days were physically demanding, but the investigative skills I developed as a lawyer were honed at my father's office. Leveraging that experience, I gradually became a known figure in the legal community over several years. When I gained strength and, through my uncle's recommendation, transferred to the New York Bar Association, it marked a new step for me. While continuing my activities at my uncle's office, I now took on a crucial role as a member of the disciplinary committee at the Bar Association. In this committee, we investigate any suspected misconduct or legal violations by lawyers and decide on appropriate disciplinary actions. I had not shared this fact with my husband, Kevin. However, things took a dramatic turn when his actions came to light, plunging him into confusion and shock. Kevin, what you've been doing is a serious issue. The disciplinary committee has started to move and investigations are already underway. He had been identifying financially struggling individuals at the citizens' consultation desk, advising them on tax evasion techniques, and receiving money in return for this advice. How could this have been discovered? Desperation and turmoil were evident in his voice. He had not anticipated his criminal activities being exposed. What followed was like a nightmare for him. The tax evasion guidance he had been providing wasn't just a personal endeavor, it was large-scale and organized. The Criminal Investigation Department of the National Police Agency had been conducting an undercover investigation into this case. As a result, Kevin was arrested on charges of tax evasion. The crime he led was extensive, going beyond the scope of a single lawyer's actions. 
Surprisingly, the person who led the investigation of this series of events was my brother. As a prosecutor who had chosen the path of law, his achievements in this case led to his long-desired transfer to the Special Investigation Department of the Prosecutor's Office. Meanwhile, for Kevin, the Bar Association's disciplinary committee was looking at him harshly, and it seemed likely he would face the most severe disciplinary action, disbarment. Disbarment would mean losing his license to practice law for at least three years, and a return to the profession afterward would be nearly impossible. Furthermore, if he receives a prison sentence or worse in court, he would completely lose his legal license. My divorce from Kevin was already finalized, and regarding the issue of compensation, I plan to demand the maximum amount. However, it's doubtful whether Kevin, now with a criminal record and having lost his job, will have the capacity to pay. My uncle deeply apologized to me for this affair. He had long suspected wrongdoing within the Bar Association and recommended my transfer to expose the corruption. At the time, I wasn't made aware of the details and the person behind it all was unknown, but now I understand why my uncle was anxious about my marriage to Kevin. His reaction when I informed him of our marriage now makes sense. However, ultimately, the fault was not my uncle's, but my lack of judgment in people that led to this situation. From this experience, I've painfully learned the difficulty of trusting people and have resolved to build relationships more cautiously in the future. My vision for the future is to continue protecting the welfare and justice of people through the power of law. I'm committed to confronting various societal issues and continually seeking the best solutions within the realm of the law. Utilizing my knowledge and experience in law, I aim to contribute to the realization of a fair and peaceful society. My duty as a legal professional lies in confronting societal injustices and pursuing justice. With this sense of mission, I want to contribute to building a better society through my daily activities. For me, law is a powerful tool for justice, and fulfilling this mission requires relentless learning and practice.